Um, we're going to start the short course. Um, maybe we can, uh, do we want to present ourselves first, introduce ourselves first, and then like start? A, can yeah, I'm going to introduce myself more when I talk, so I can at least yeah. say who I am. Just say our name. So my name is Audrey Lesperance. I'm um, a research associate and a strategic advisor to the Center of Excellence on Partnership with Patients and the Public. This is my colleague. So, Sylvain, I'm a heart transplant recipient. I'm also patient coordinator for a couple of national groups. <laughs> so, let's start with the Canadian National Transplant Research Program and Canadian Arrhythmia Network. So, I'll keep it simple and proceed. Yeah. So my name is Isabel Jordan, and first and foremost, I'm a parent to two teenagers, and one of whom uh, has a rare disease. And I'm also a chair of the Rare Disease Foundation, which is a national organization. And I've also been a patient partner on a variety of different uh, research uh, endeavors. I'm the, <coughs> excuse me. Is it, am I on the mic? Yeah. Yes? Okay, I don't hear it. I'm um, Beverly Cannon. I'm the patient um, advocate, patient partner. I have been an advocate for about 18 years in um, the United States mainly. And um, I'm here because one of the many hats that I wear as an advocate is with the Cancer and Aging Research Group. And um, we are here with, um, I did not know the Society for Medical Decision Making until I was asked to participate here, and I am so excited, I cannot tell you how much. Oh, I should say, we're both co-chairs for the for this uh, meeting. Hi, I'm Marisol <coughs> Tremblay. I'm an assistant professor at Université Laval at the Department of Family Medicine and Emergency Medicine. I'm a health services researcher with a background in social science, so I'm not a clinician. I don't do clinical research, uh, but I'm interested in partnering, partnering with different kind of actors and uh, indigenous community, indigenous patient partner. Thank you. Um, so uh, Sylvain and I are gonna present to you a quick introduction to patient partnership, patient engagement in research, and also open the discussion on uh, involving uh, a diverse area of people and, and from different backgrounds uh, in research and why we should be doing that. Um, and it's, it's uh, w we want to do an introduction, so kind of set the stage for uh, the rest of the presenters today. So Sylvain, just jump in whenever mm -hmm. you, fit, you, you see fit. Um, so the presentation is split into two parts. First is about patient <coughs> engagement at large in research, and the second part are about challenges in engaging diverse populations. Um, there's a big difference be in between patient-oriented research and patient engagement in research, and I wanted to start the conversation by setting um, that difference uh, very clearly. Um, patient-oriented research is a specific type of research where the patient uh, is the focus of the investigation, meaning that you don't necessarily need to engage patient in research to do patient-oriented research. So you could be in between researchers doing patient-oriented research, while when you engage patient in research, there's, I think, and I, I think, people would agree with me, there's uh, necessarily a plus value um, in uh, bringing in patient voices uh, within your research projects and your research networks. Um, so in research, uh, patient engagement occurs when patient meaningfully and actively collaborate in the governance, priority setting, conduct of research, as well as in summarizing and distributing, sharing, uh, disseminating our research results. Uh, within the research community, but also outside of the research community to uh, the patient community as well. So patient, we will mostly talk about patient partnership, me and Sylvain, but it's, it's a very specific lens to patient engagement, which is a va vast area of modes of engagement. Patient partnership is, um, is trying to reach for co-design, so co-production of research with patient. 
And so patient partnership uh, is also um, uh, engaging patients at the care level within their own care, but it's that idea of being active in your own care um, and is, is translated within other levels of engagement, so at the project level, at the organizational level, so meaning that we shouldn't be doing anything without patients, no, so no, nothing about the patients without the patients. So engagement and partnership uh, are sometimes two things that are pretty, um, or, or two labels that sometimes are, are, are um, interrelated, uh, sometimes they are um, meaning the same thing in the minds of people, so sometimes we say partner, but it's mostly people that are um, consulted within a research project, sometimes we say partner, it's, it's an involvement of research partners, um, and, but when we talk about partnership, we talk about co-production, which is another type of approach. So the approach is that you can see here, um, the patient is not at the middle like patient-oriented research sh would be, uh, but patient is part of a research team. So it's, it's um, an expert at the same level as any expert in the research team, and it would be the same graph if we were to talk about care, uh, about you know, um, individual health care. Um, so the patient is an expert in living with an illness, but also living within the system. So even for researchers that are interested in, you know, systemic approaches or or um, uh, the the policies or, or uh, service delivery, uh, still patient have a, a 360 um, vision of what the system is and how they can live it. Mm -hmm. Actually, if I can add something about that. Uh, First, uh, no, I'm, it's about, uh, <coughs> so what I, the easiest thing that I found when I talk to patient is that you are a consultant with related default <laughs> on the research they're doing. Because sometimes they really have a hard time to see what is patient, partner, engagement, and all that. And I think in those two, one say, uh, one knows why, and the other no, no, uh, the other one knows how and what is the problem and how do I deal with that. The other one they all have the scientific explication, but the, the human side, the, the side effects and the living with it, it's, uh, it's the patient. So it's bringing those two communities together to, to work together and bring uh, new ideas and added value to the projects. Yeah, and I would, I would add to that that as a researcher, we need to figure out if what we do is actually pertinent or relevant. And sometimes patients say, no, this is not the problem. So this is a minor problem for me on a day-to-day -day basis. This is the actual problem that you should research on. And that is pretty amazing. Um, and, and sometimes uh, it, it asks for researchers to be humble <laughs> in, what, in their endeavor. And you might even save money because you yeah. might <laughs> have your mind set on something that doesn't relate to any needs of the patient. It's just in your mind that you say, oh, that's a great idea. But at some point, they might just tell you, just just do that line at the time. That's the needs. And then suddenly, you're saving $200,000. There you go. So you can finance another project or whatever afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so it, it, it needs, we need to make a difference in between a subject because patients are involved in our projects as you know, clinic in, in clinical trials and many types of research in healthcare research, we do imply, you know, we do involve patients, but usually as, you know, as subjects are of, of, our, um, of our research endeavors. Now we need to think about partnering with patients, so being co-PIs. Co with patients. Sylvain is co PI on a few projects right now. Um, he's he's um, at the same level of any principal investigator. He can ask for money here in Canada. We can, you know, he can write his name uh, you know, with a PI and get money f and funding for research. This is, you know, truly a step, you know, not 
further, but a step very, um, very big towards like co-production. So as I said, there are multiple modes of engagement, of course. There are many different representation. This is our own representation of the modes of engagement. But of course, you have um, you know, information, consultation, participation, which are you know, labels we kind of understand, know, um, and, and partnership, which would mean co-production. But we also like to put confrontation, where you know, uh, for many years, we've been talking about patients as militants, activists that also have to ask for and 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 and, and be um, um, and be uh, in a ro uh, revendication type of relationship, uh, and sometimes uh, researchers see that as um, very adversarial to research, which I think is just one other way to get into a relationship with a system that is not always so responsive to patients and what they. Uh, what they want and what they, they should get from us. In research, you can, of course, get um, to involve in many ways, uh, but at different levels. So this is a representation coming from um, a paper from um, Shippy, but um, usually he's, that he's, um, the, the, the article is, is showing that at every stage of a research project, you can involve patients in many different ways and use the patient involvement um, to enhance your research endeavor and make it more pertinent, more relevant, more uh, impactful. Um, and so that at the operational level, at the tactical level, but also at the strategic level, as uh, Sylvain said, he's involved with two major networks in Canada, which are uh, thinking about how to engage patients, but not just at the project level in you know, studies, but also at the network level saying, how can the network support patient engagement and uh, the uh, work of uh, different researchers individually? Challenges, of course there are challenges. The first is what I just mentioned about you know, uh, involving patients that want to be uh, or, 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 or can be at the same time people having one hat of an activist. So um, it's, it's having you know, a, a source of knowledge that is more technical, law oriented, oriented towards the, the representation of rights. Uh, while what we want as a partner is someone that can be um, reflective on his own or her own experience with health and illness and the system and bring that to the table as a co-productor of science. Um, it's not, as I said, completely mutually exclusive, but it's different types of, of, uh, of action and, and of meaning. And that can also be a challenge because usually um, researchers are very um, are very scared of the activist sides of of patient which uh, is also like uh, and for the small story I come from political science so I'm uh, I'm, I'm always a little surprised of seeing how, how you know um, <coughs> how scared we are of, of patients asking mm -hmm. for things so that is that I is for me I think a big mm -hmm. challenge mm -hmm. maybe the the best story that I can have is at the Canadian National Transplant Research. Uh, they, we, uh, um, we have a great story about a uh, clinician who wanted to uh, see how it happens when uh, some potential donors come in in ICU and if they will end up donors or not and all that. So they were asking uh, families in crisis that comes in an ICU to see if they want to collaborate. So when they told me about the project, I said, forget it. <laughs> Nobody's gonna ask. So finally what they, uh, they called Heather, who's a mom of a donor. Uh, her son gave this organ. And uh, she actually went through all the questionnaire, all the, uh, um, the uh, you know, a consentment form and all that. And she said, that First, change your name, this is too rough, or whatever. That you can ask those questions, these ones uh, take it out and all that, so they work together. When usually we talk about organ donation, it's pretty an advocate thing, and we have to, to change the rules, we have to do that, blah, 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 so it's really, but for her, it was just how far can we go with 
people that are in crisis like that. And the outcomes are amazing because uh, now the research is in five countries. The uh, acceptance of the people that are approached is 95%. And instead of having 250 something subjects, they, ha they are now are over 600. So just asking how far can we go using the knowledge of Heather who's a great, uh, she's 60, she, she's Jewish too, so she, it was against, supposedly against her, her, her religion, but all that, and there she goes. That's an amazing, so they're actually, tomorrow I'm there and that actually presenting the second part of their new research about uh, death and all that, so it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, historically, I think that in research we saw a lot of gr uh, patient groups coming in being more on the advocate side and, and try to prevent, you know, ask and, and, and also um, be, uh, be contesting some aspects of, of, of research. But now we see patients uh, as organizations, but also individually try to come and, and co-produce. And I think that is a big, it can be, a, um, you know, I, I put it in, ch in the challenge because um, it's, it still is something that we hear. It sounds, it's a challenge that people state. It's a sometimes a fear that um, that uh, constrains people to, you know, co and, and involve patients, but that should actually be something that we uh, tackle and see. Um, just to give you a little story of what we do, because we talk about partnership, and partnership is co-design, and in co-design it means that you need to have a little bit of literacy um, to go and sit beside a researcher and do a research project, and I'd say we involved patient in uh, fundamental research science project so it's even you know further away from the care from you know the actual ground where uh, and the actual experience and expertise sometimes of patients but actually we were able to get to a point of co-production because we um, we train patient and we get them um, uh, to be able to mobilize their experiential knowledge through uh, what we we call a competency building through um, through uh, time. So what we do is that we take a patient that already has you know experience and wants to get involved in research, and we um, we train them to get to to get to a um, to a, to a a place of patient partners, so the first experience of patient partnership. And with time and experience, patients become what we, what we call patient coach. So Sylvain is a patient coach, so he's able to coach other patients to get involved in research and, and to sustain their, their first experience and reflect with them about that experience, et cetera. The problem with this um, competency building thing is what I will um, show just right here. So we have uh, in our organization a, a list of almost 250 patients partner that were involved in um, the training of young medical students at the University of Montreal. So we use that competency building program. So we were training them, supporting them, coaching them through time. And um, we wanted to see if that list of people was reflect a reflection of the patient the Canadian patients, you know, that all big community, because representativity is, and re uh, representability is, is um, a discourse and a, a question we get uh, a lot. So you're building competencies, but are they, you know, a, ref a good reflection of what the Canadian community is? And I can tell you by, because we did the, the, the study, no. Our um, 118 patients, which we had, you know, the basic information to compare, um, our patients are usually older, so 50 years old, um, and the mean in the Canadian community is 43. Uh, they're usually females, 70% of them, uh, usually retired, um, and um, most of them have two, uh, two conditions or, or more, which is the same as the Canadian community. And the pred predominant health conditions in our uh, sample is cancer, major trauma, and mood disorder. While if you look at the Canadian community, it's mostly uh, cancer, major trauma, and mood disorder are very low in um, the types of um, of conditions that we uh, that the Canadian community has actually um, 
uh, inside. What, what does that mean? So it's honestly, it wasn't surprising for us. We didn't say, well, oh my God, it's not supposed to be that way. We were actually very, you know, very unsurprised of the, of the, of the results. At the same time, uh, there's a lot of issues about, oh, you only have one patient, so it's not representative of all the other patients. But if we sit in a research project, and if we really want to touch every basic t subject that will be touched, that would mean probably that we would have or need maybe 40 <laughs> researchers, two etticians, two uh, immunologists or whatever. Uh, so we have to see something else than just a cancer or something. They're also, when I talk to my story, I'm, yeah, I'm a heart transplant, <laughs> I, uh, heart failure, but I've so, I also have been 38 years in the emergency and hospital and all that. So when I'm sitting in a bed, I'm not just seeing my HF, I'm seeing other people. I'm in the system. So I, uh, for me, I'm not just considered, in my head, has a heart transplant. I can also understand the system and things like that. So, so if you do the balance, yeah, it's unbalanced, but uh, when I sit down with researchers, Sometimes it's unbalanced. It's unbalanced too. So I think we have to be uh, aware of that and keep that in mind too. Yeah. yeah. So uh, for me, it was important to you, you bring that question in uh, for the discussion we're going to have because mm -hmm. you know we're not asking researchers to be representative of the Canadian population. We usually don't also ask you know the patient to be representative of. Um, we should not be asking, uh, but we should be doing a lot of work in maintaining um, a more diverse type, you know, of patients partnering with researchers. So it's, it's not, you know, it's to think about diversity as diversity and not necessarily as representability uh, of the Canadian or the, the American or the, the, the society or the community you're, um, you're researching in. Just a few things that are very important and I'll let the other ones uh, talk about diversity and, and involving, you know, uh, diverse and uh, patients with uh, uh, different backgrounds. But I'd say for generally for in involving patients, there are good best practices, and I'd say that the one, um, the one that that uh, the few ones that I can sh and show you is that with any patient, whatever their background, you need to, as a researcher, build trust and relationship. Take the time to know that person. Take the time to know their history, their, their, their path. Um, and that is the key to understanding how you can co-build or co-produce what your, uh, your research. Um, recognize their expertise. Uh, recognize that they have a knowledge that you don't have as a researcher, that you won't be able to mobilize. And as a researcher, I can tell you that as long as you've never done it, you will be doubtful. The first time you're gonna be doing it, you won't go back, that's for sure. Involve early, involve even before you think about prioritizing or getting into a project. You have an idea, sit down with a patient, test it, uh, ask them what they think about it. As early as possible, that patient will become more and more able to be a co-productor of research because they will think with you as you do with your colleagues or with your co-researchers sit down and talk and 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 test communicate clearly and be transparent when you when you send you know draft stuff to other co-researcher you should involve and put the patients in the loop this is just common teamwork. You do the same with the patient, they don't have a different status within your research, your research team. Define your goals, the roles and the responsibility of each player. And that's not just defining the roles of the patients, it's all also d defining the roles of you know, the PI, the manager of the research or the study. It's, it's understanding who does what and showing also to your new partner that this person is there for that purpose and this person is there and that has that knowledge. So if you need something, there's also, you know, it's not just, you know, uh, the, a one person endeavor and that's, that's really important. Um, and budget for patient partnership. Um, in your research budget, you should involve or you should put a little, a little or more, it depends on 
your stance and your organization's stance on that, per, on that point, but you should budget for, um, for your partner so they get a status that helps them to be involved and keeps them involved on the long run. And I'm finishing on a few uh, challenges. The first one would be language. Language in many ways is a, you know, I'm, we're from Quebec, Sylvain and I. We're based here in Montreal. Everything's done in French, but a lot of our research projects are done in English, even though the most part of our colleagues are francophones. We get to have to talk and to speak in English and to deal with, you know, and, and do research mostly in English. That's the reality of things, and it's okay for professionals, but when I involve patients, sometimes those patients don't have the same level of English or don't, don't actually speak English. Uh, so that is one language issue or barrier, but it can be also just the way we speak. We have, you know, jargon in what we, uh, uh, in what we do, and we should get rid as much as possible um, of these jargon and, and these vocabulary that no one understands but us. Um, stop using acronyms or <laughs> try to explain acronyms to people. Um, the time and the time zone uh, are important. The pace of work is also an important part of what you should be thinking about. You know, some patients are still having the conditions that made them the experts they are. So thinking about, you know, having meetings in the morning or at night, um, meetings that, the, that are, you know, three hour long or th stuff like that are very difficult um, to deal with for some people. Uh, and you should be open to that. Uh, costs and delayed payment. Uh, some people are, um, are very, uh, you know, we, we don't see that as a problem, but um, for, p for patient, it could be a very big pair to involving in research. And, and having unclear roles and responsibility <coughs> and, and feel as a patient that you're kind of floating in an environment you don't know. Um, it's cool when you travel to be in another culture, but when you're supposed to be a partner and co-working and dealing and, and co-producing with people, feeling that way should not happen. So uh, it's not a cool thing to not know what you're expected to do, what you should be doing, uh, where you should sit, um, how you should speak, um, and, and these things should be discussed prior to an involvement. So these are you know, a, a few ideas that are broader than the discussions we're, we're gonna have today. And I think that there are other challenges that are more specific to, you know, diverse population and in, involving harder to reach uh, patients. But uh, these are very general and we thought it was important to show them to you this morning. Thank you. Isabel? Oh uh, no, it's, it's Beverly. No, no, not Beverly. Not <laughs> <laughs> So I've been asked to talk about partnering with indigenous patients and communities. But first of all, I would like to take a little moment to acknowledge and honor the Kanyanka, Kanyanka sorry, Mohawk people who take care of the territory on which we stand today. So that's the first thing. And Then I would like to introduce a little bit myself more. So who am, who am I? I'm a proud mother of two. I'm of settler descent, uh, but I consider myself as an ally. I'm motivated by social justice and equity. Uh, so it's with great humility that I come here to, um, uh, as a health services researcher that has been working with indigenous communities and indigenous patient partners since 2013. Um, so now, who are indigenous patient and community? So indigenous is, is the acceptable term when referring to first people, so people of long settlement uh, who were their first at contact. So it's always uh, better to go with 
uh, what people are calling their themselves. So uh, indigenous is the term, is the preferred term uh, by indigenous people to, to talk about themselves. So um, yeah, I just wanted to emphasize this. Uh, in Canada, indigenous people comprise First Nation, Inuit, Métis population. Uh, and what is really important to know is that it's not a monolithic population at all. They have a, it, there's a huge uh, variety of culture, uh, language, art, music. Uh, so it's very, they have really different cultural backgrounds. And it's really important to um, acknowledge this. Uh, and the other thing I would like to, to uh, emphasize is that indigenous people from different backgrounds have become role models and have helped to shape the Canadian cultural identity. So we often uh, hear a lot of negative things or facts about indigenous people. So I think it's important to, uh, to start with this uh, positive uh, image also uh, of indigenous people. However, despite their great diversity, they share a similar history of oppression, marginalization, uh, f uh, and related to colonization. So they have a, a share history of oppression and margi marginalization. Okay. Um, and then I wanted to, uh, to talk about this point, uh, why it's important to partner uh, with indigenous people and indigenous community. We have to be careful because engagement, engagement policies, engagement uh, research approach often um, benefit, um, better benefit people who have al already uh, greater access and better health uh, and, uh, and often also higher social uh, economic uh, level status as uh, Audrey uh, pointed in her presentation too. Uh, so marginalized marginal <laughs> population, sorry, uh, they are harder to reach and to engage in research. And so that's why it's really important to do specific effort to engage them and reach them. Um, uh, because otherwise they experience a double exclusion, first on the basis of a lack of access to decision making and another exclusion from the fact that they uh, that uh, the need, wants, value, culture of group other than, than their own are predominant in the system. Uh, so it's only through uh, genuine and uh, equitable participation that indigenous community and, and people can take action for self-determination, change, and empowerment. So where to begin when uh, you want to partner with, uh, with communities? I will talk first about research with communities. Uh, as some of you may know, there's a, there are many set of standards that establish ground rule for research with indigenous community. Um, there are different research protocols that have been defined uh, by and for uh, indigenous uh, people to work with them and that uh, stipulate all data can be uh, collected, uh, protected, used, or shared. So one of the most well-known maybe is the OCAP um, principle, which are ownership, control, access, possession. There's also the three, uh, three council policy statement on research with uh, involving First Nation methods uh, in with people of Canada. There's also other ones. Uh, there's a lot of, and all of them serve as ethical framework for the conduct of research with communities. And they are all tied to their rights of protection and self-determination and value of participation, uh, uh, re reciprocity, justice, respect. So um, where to begin? I would say uh, 
a little bit like Audrey, the, the first step I think is to establish contact to develop relationship and engage with indigenous communities, organization or people uh, before even exploring the possibility of a project. And then if you're working with communities, you will have to, uh, to define a formal agreement with communities and organization. And there it's, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit different in the case of patient partner because uh, when working with indigenous patient partners, you don't necessarily need a formal agreement from uh, their community organizations since patients are uh, collabor collaborating on their own uh, from their experiential perspective and they don't necessarily represent uh, their community. But uh, if you're working with communities, then you, you'll have to, to get this formal uh, agreement with, uh, with them uh, and you'll have to comply with standards of, of uh, an ethical framework for this kind of research. And uh, obviously if you're working with indigenous participants, this is really different. And there, Audrey talked about this a little bit more also, but there's a difference between uh, a participant and patient partners. Uh, in the case of participant, you're collecting data uh, on people who are part of a community of a culture, so, so then uh, this is really um, different. And finally, you, you may have to respect uh, specific cultural protocols and co codes of research practice when working with elders and knowledge holders from community. So they are really different depending on the community, but it may involve a specific invi invitation to, uh, for, to elders uh, giving uh, a gift uh, giving tobacco, uh, uh, smudge ceremonies, uh, but it, it really depends on the, the community. So now I would like to talk uh, about um, uh, one of my projects, which is a, a one-year strategic initiative, uh, uh, which was called the Platform Stratégique d'Engagement des Patients Partenaires Autochtones dans la Recherche. Uh, so this project aimed at recruiting, training, supporting uh, new indigenous patient partners so they can play an active role in research. Uh, so it was a one-year engagement initiative, so I'm, 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 f I'm focusing here on engagement. It, w it wasn't a research project with a research question and all this. It was really a mobilization initiative to, uh, to form new um, uh, indigenous patient partner. So we used a participatory uh, approach involving a core committee of indigenous uh, uh, organizational partner uh, who were involved in defining the goal and the process of the initiative, uh, recruiting indigenous patient partner, uh, identifying strategy to empower patient in their new role. So that's us, basically. <laughs> the, there were some people were lacking on this photo, but yeah. So what we did uh, concretely, we uh, we worked with organizational partners and we recruited seven indigenous patient partners living with diabetes from different communities in Quebec to form the patient partner team. Uh, we met mostly uh, remotely on eight occasion. We also organized a one-day training to uh, reinforce project member capacity regarding uh, patient-oriented research. And we uh, put in place different strategy to, uh, uh, to empower patient in their new role. This strategy included, for instance, creating a document clarifying the role of research, mem of research team member, including patient. We offered concrete opportunities to partner in external research project. We provided supportive follow-ups uh, for patients involved in this project, etc. So after one year, we did an evaluation of the project. Uh, it was a case study design. Uh, we used uh, documentation analysis and qualitative interviews with 
uh, with the, the member of the project following the end of the, the project. So the, the evaluation aimed at identifying barriers and facilitators to um, indigenous patient engagement in research. Uh, and what we found, so uh, results uh, provided listen regarding indigenous patient partner engagement in research. And what is interesting is that each of these listen can be related to different step of the engagement process or component of the engagement process. So for instance, for the recruitment, the first contact with patient partners, what the, the project taught, taught us was to meet people di directly in communities, to build on existing uh, relationship with local organization and key members of community. Also when building engagement, so, um, sustaining the engagement of the, the patient partner, what we learn is to uh, is that developing trusting and quality relationship with them uh, was um, really important and, and this could be uh, achieved by multiplying in-person contact and follow-up. Uh, be flexible regarding engagement role av availability of patient partners. And when building capacities of patient, uh, what has proved particularly difficult in our project was to foster, um, was, was to uh, understand the, the role of the patient partner. Um, for, for patient, it was really uh, difficult. So it's really important to foster a clear understanding of this role, um, develop competency, self-confidence with training and positive feed feedback. Uh, when particip uh, participating in other project, external research project, what has been important is to offer many opportunities for engagement uh, and to adapt project and language to patient needs and capacity. Uh, favor bidirectional learning opportunity because patients also want to learn more about their disease. They don't, it's not only the researcher learning about the experiential uh, um, knowledge of uh, living with a specific disease um, and to value patient participation. And finally, uh, with the outcome of participation, what was important is to value the patient contribution to the project and to favor, if possible, the direct impact of the project for, for patient and their community. And uh, all this is really, uh, I think is really echoing what Audrey and Sylvain has uh, presented before. So, <coughs> uh, so the result of this project are consistent with existing literature, but uh, we also had specific challenge related to engaging indigenous patient partners uh, from different community, and these included, for instance, the need to take into account various cultural context. So some of our patients were living in urban settings, uh, other ones on a reserve. Uh, so they had really different realities. Um, adjusting to varying level of literacy, access to technology. For instance, some of our uh, patient partner had no telephone number, no email address, nor no, ba no bank account for uh, financial compensation. <laughs> Um, accommodating other personal life challenge. So they had a, a, also uh, a lot of personal challenge in their life who um, um, kind of ended their participation. For instance, a dad in the family, uh, being a caregiver for a family member uh, requiring uh, extensive uh, treatment for their disease. And finally, um, I think that there's also listen on this project for um, uh, working with margina marginalized population who has been histori uh, historically disempowered by institution and society. Um, some, uh, of, uh, for some of our uh, patient partners, and I, I wrote participant, but it's 
partner, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so some partners in our project were lacking self-confidence and, and some even felt like imposter in their role of research partner. And this may arise, and it's an hypothesis, it's not necessarily uh, something that is uh, uh, general, but that, that may arise as a, a, an effect of disempowerment, of historical disempowerment. So there's a need to frequently value and pro, uh, provide positive feedback uh, on their participation. Um, also, some partner were distrustful of institution and were reluctant to provide personal inf information to uh, the university, f for instance, for financial compensation. Uh, so we need to be really, really flexible uh, in institutional procedure, and that's not always easy <laughs> because the institution and university are not always really flexible. Um, and finally, some participants and many participants, many partners, I, I mean, uh, had a hard, hard time understanding the concept and the role of a patient partner uh, as an active actor in the research process. It was really, really long before they, they get it. And I think it's, it, it's because it challenged the vision of passive, uh, passive patients and the implicit power uh, imbalance underly, underlying the patient concept. And, and for them, it, it was really um, hard to understand. Oops. So in conclusion, um, uh, it's really important, it's crucial to take into account um, the need, experience, knowledge of uh, indigenous patient partners. So it's really, really crucial to engage uh, these kind of, of uh, population in, 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 in patient-oriented research. And the keys are to uh, value, respect, being open and flexible. So thank you very much. I guess I'm up now, and um, I can, I am partnering with older adults and minorities, I can just say all of the above and sit back and <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, thank you very much. Um, it, it uh, you know, there, there really are not that many distinctions and particularly if you're taking a generalization like, like this, older adults and minorities, um, rather than specific communities as was just described here. So before I get into my talk, I, I'm not gonna let you off that easy. I will do a little bit. Um, I, want, I want to uh, let you know a little bit more about me. Um, I do what I do because I was diagnosed with breast cancer in late 2000 and I couldn't get the answers that I wanted to help support my decision making about my treatment. My surgeon didn't always agree with me but she was someone I could talk to. We could really have a dialogue but then I was referred to a medical oncologist who told me that I had to have chemo. And the research that I had done with my specific diagnosis indicated that I might not benefit that much from having chemo and I didn't want to compromise um, my immune system. But she insisted I had to have chemo. Well, you don't tell me I have to do anything. Um, I never saw that um, doctor again and I did not do chemo and I'm 18 years later, uh, 20 years later actually. Um, so, um, since that time, I have worn many hats, as I mentioned, as an advocate, um, and most, mostly for the first few years, it was mostly concentrated on breast cancer, um, but a few years ago, I met researchers um, from the Cancer and Aging Research Group and became very much involved with them. And that is how I come to be here. Now, 
The first questions that come to mind when you think of, of a topic of patient engagement and partnering with older adults and minorities, uh, why engage with patients in research? What is a patient partner? And a few other questions, all of which have already been answered. So I'm not gonna go in, into that. Um, what I would like to do, and I'm going to try to coordinate two things so I can see what I'm doing here while you see what I'm doing there, and it works. So some of the questions that we might address, what do we mean by older adults and minority? How do these diverse populations view medical research and clinical trials? Um, as biomedical or behavioral, does it make a difference? What kind of uh, research? And also a uh, little bit about how to find and work with patient partners and advocacy organizations. Now, older adults <laughs> are getting older. That picture, I don't know if you can um, really see that picture is a slumber party of, of uh, 60 and older people. And that's, that doesn't even show the whole room. So I'm asking, you know, is 65 the new 50? And some research researchers are really beginning to think in terms of older, 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 and oldest, because we have such a large population now that's living actively into their 90s and even into 100s. It's not unusual anymore to look at an obituary page and see someone who's over 100 has just died. So what do we mean by minority? I mean, I'm given this general term and what, what are we talking about? That's the first thing that comes to our mind, usually ethnic minorities. But ethnic minorities are too numerous to count, even when you break down these that are in the census, the African American, Hispanic, Asian, American Indian, or Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, or other Pacific. If you look at those and break them down, you still have subgroups, you have minorities within. How do you break out Hispanic? There are so many differences in Hispanic cultures. There are so many differences in Asian cultures. And then what about the LB, uh, LGBTQ, or children as a minority, or people with certain religious beliefs um, who don't want to deal with, meta I mean, they, they may carry them as far as, as refusing all medical um, help. Do you want to engage and try to engage those people? That's minority group. And um, deaf people, Many, many deaf people do not consider themselves disabled. They feel as if with technological assistance, um, they are as able as anyone else, but they tend to be classified as disabled. So we have a, a subgroup there. We have a minority group there. What do we do with, with that? Okay, so in treatment, we basically, with the older adults, we talk about um, functional age being much more important than chronological age, um, and, um, and, and, and that's, that is very, very true, and there's been a lot of research, and geriatric assessment tools have been designed to help uh, evaluate uh, functional status. But I maintain that attitudes are shaped by chronological age. And when you're dealing with older adults, um, you have to remember what informs them. See, I usually read and I'm not reading, so I have to find where I am, so, okay. Um, blacks remember or have stories passed down 
about the infamous exper experiments run by the United States Public Health Service at Tuskegee University, where men were actually given syphilis. If you don't know about this, they were actually given syphilis without their knowledge. They thought they were being in treatment to help illness, and they were actually being given syphilis so that the disease could be tracked and treatment doses evaluated, determined, um, which is, you know, totally outrageous. And we, we remember that. That was, um, that, that ended in 1972, believe it or not. It was still being done in 1972. And then we have in the 50s and the 60s, it was <coughs> pregnant women were given uh, thalidomide um, to treat nausea. And it was later found out that it resulted in severe birth defects to children. DES is a synthetic form of estrogen that was prescribed for pregnant women between 1940 and 40, 1941 because it was thought to prevent miscarriages. It turned out the children who were exposed to DES in the womb had higher rates of cancer and uh, other hormone related, uh, higher rates of hormone related cancer and other health issues. Um, and they are plagued with them today. I, I have a friend who is a DES child, as they call themselves, and has written a book about her experience as a DES child. And she still has recurring health problems that are connected to that. Probably um, the most impactful um, was the hormone replacement uh, therapy that was <coughs> withdrawn in 2002, the most popular hormone replacement therapy that women were taking um, at, during menopause um, was found to do more harm than benefit in a study that was being done by the Women's Health Initiative, and they stopped the study early in 2002. So, People remember that or they've heard about it and it gives them, you know, we talk about trust. How do you trust when that's the experiences that we're hearing about? And we're also always getting mixed messages, right? Is, uh, is coffee good for you or is it bad for you or genetically mod modified foods harmful? Um, what about moderate alcohol consumption? They now say, you know, no, any level of, of alcohol consumption um, hires your risk of cancers. Um, and, and, but yet we're promoting, you know, so what do I do with that information? This 20, year, 20 drugs in 20 years taken off the market, that was as of five years ago. And I know of at least three drugs since that time that have been taken off the market after approval by the FDA on the market and they're taken off. So how do you have trust? This is what we have to overcome. I don't have an answer. So don't expect the next slide is gonna tell you how to, how to do this. I don't have an answer, but it is a, a big question. It's something that we have to consider when we're reaching out to older people. They know this, they have the history, they've experienced it. So when it comes to um, min minority groups, we, uh, where am I? Cultural competence is, you know, what we hear all the time, cultural competence. So what, what, what is it? According to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration of the United States Department of Health and Human Services, cultural competence means to be respectful and responsive to the health beliefs and practices and cultural and linguistic needs of diverse population groups. It's been said here. Developing cultural competence is also an evolving dynamic process that takes time and occurs along a continuum. 
Culture is a term that goes beyond just race or ethnicity. It can also refer to such characteristics as age, gender, sexual orientation, disability, religion, income level, education, geographical location, or profession. And I underlined that. Um, how many people attended the symposium last night? I thought that was just fantastic. Um, it was such a great example of, um, of, of culture, of, of understanding that there are differences in culture. And you know, just one example that's very striking, and if you were there, I'm sure you uh, reacted as, as I did to the fact that it's not shyness that keeps indigenous people from looking at you. It's that they believe that it is disrespectful to look you in the face. Whereas we learn from the time that we're children, you make sure you look them in the eye when you talk to them. You go to an interview, you have to look them in the eye. But this is, you know, there's such a difference in my thinking between shyness and disrespect. I mean, if you don't understand that, just think of, of, of the traps that you can fall into when you're trying to reach out to people. So um, it's, it's really essential um, to be genuinely respectful of cultural differences, especially when they're that far different from you. And um, how do you find them? You, I got so carried away here. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I just want to say, um, okay, I had called cultural competence the magic formula. And what I want to say is it's not an easy formula. It may be magic when it works, but it isn't easy. And the way I think to get through it is really to reach out and find someone in the culture that you want to approach and have them really clearly, you know, someone who understands two cultures and can help you navigate that because in particularly in research you you engage people you get part way into a project and you suddenly hit an impasse and you don't necessarily know why and it can be simply because you look somebody in the face when you shouldn't have it can be that simple so i'm i'm going to end with a, a couple of examples of um of, of re engaging um, first older adults and then a minority group in research. And the first one <coughs> is, oops, doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Oh, don't worry. Um, this is a pet project of mine that I, oh, Beverly. Okay, stakeholders for care and oncology and research for our elders, um, known as School Board. It's a patient and caregiver advisory group. It is um, with a grant that was funded by the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute uh, for Corey, and it was improving communication with older patients with cancer using geriatric assessment. And it was done at the University of Rochester with the principal investigator, Supriya Mohile, uh, MD. And she says all the time what you said. This is the first time I worked with patients in research, and I will never do research again without patients. And she says this repeatedly. And what we did, we, um, Um, we recruited 
I, I met um, Supriya Molihele at a meeting very similar to this and began talking to her. I had not even realized that there was this geriatric oncology push going on. And of course, I was very interested. Um, <clears throat> and so I spoke to her and she said she had in mind to develop a, a project um, to establish basically what we did is to see whether providing an oncologist with geriatric assessment results improve the communication between the patient and the oncologist in decision making about chemotherapy, about treatment. And we did it with um, a controlled trial and, um, and we recorded the events and then they were all analyzed and, and broken down. So we um, recruited 14 cancer patients over the age of 65 or caregivers of cancer patients over the age of 65 and experienced patient um, advocates. We were able to do this because of the Cancer and Aging Research Group, which is a basically a national organization, although people from Canada and, and other parts of the world actually join calls every other week. We have a one hour uh, webinar call at, where the um, researchers share their ideas, sh share their, get feedback from each other. It's wonderful. There's no competitive sense. It's not the usual institutional thing. And so we were able to tell them that we wanted to establish this uh, stakeholders group and they gave us referrals. So of, of, of those 14 people, we had representatives from North Carolina, from New York State, not just Rochester, from Connecticut, from Illinois, and California. So, and then we met monthly on a, an hour and a half webinar call. And we actually participated at every, every level of the research. Um, we did the consent form. We spent hours and days and weeks um, inputting about the consent forms, which are onerous. Um, we made some headway, but you know, there are institutional challenges and you could only go just so far. But we did that. We did um, flyers, posters. We did questionnaires to be used with the patients. We reviewed all of the materials that were used were reviewed, passed through scoreboard, and we had very, very significant influence on the way that study was done and the way it helped considerably in enabling them to recruit for the study. It was a large study, 500 patients. So, um, <clears throat> and we have now um, participated in writing manuscripts. We are co-authors on manuscripts that have come out of the results of the uh, conference. And we have that R21, R33 at the bottom is a new grant. You're shaking, you know about it? Okay, this is very, very exciting. It's a grant to the Cancer and Aging Research Group through City of Hope and University of Rochester and it is to develop, it's a five-year grant. The R21 is from the National Institutes of Health and the R33 portion, um, which is the last three years, is from the National Institute on Aging. And it is to develop an infrastructure for CARD for promoting um, cancer and aging research. And it involves mentoring and developing um, uh, uh, geriatric oncologists and, you know, historically I always like to say geriatricians know nothing about oncology and oncologists knew nothing about geriatrics and, and yet, you know, cancer is a disease of the aging and so it's very exciting to see this move along and develop. Um, and so that scoreboard and then Whoops. 
somebody's walking. Can you advance that slide? Thank you. This I am totally excited about. This, this is just last month. Um, Jerry Brown in California, the governor of California, signed uh, a nail salon education bill. And that is the direct result of research that started back in um, 2005 with a pilot award and uh, 2007 a full award by the California Breast Cancer Research Program to the Asia Health Services in collaboration with the Northern Cal California Cancer Center um, and the two PIs uh, names are listed there. The reason that I'm so excited about it is that I was um, a peer reviewer for this grant when it first came in both the pilot and the full grant. And I know firsthand that patients were involved in this study all the way through. And to be able to see, you know, they weren't alone, obviously, after the results of the study were published and then other groups <coughs> come in together, you know, to um, lobby in uh, the state to, um, to get a bill written and then pushed, but it all goes back to the patient involvement because they found that um, salon workers were getting sick and they thought it had to do with their exposure to chemicals in the uh, cosmetics that they were using. And they did not, for professional use, they, they did not have to identify and actually everywhere else they don't have to. I mean, this is a first in California, but in my view, it really goes back to this research of engagement by patients. So don't think that it's not going to lead to something, something very, very positive, because to me, this is exactly why we're there. So I'm just going to leave you with a, a kind of busy slide that shows a little bit about um, some of the uh, organizations and uh, resources that you can have uh, to find patients um, who are interested in research. ASCO is the American Society of Clinical Oncologists. They have a patient advocate program, as does the American Association for Cancer Research. Um, the National Cancer Institute has a CARA program, which um, has uh, patients, um, connects patients with researchers. The National Breast Cancer Coalition has, um, actually does a um, project lead as a course for advocates to learn about basic um, science of breast cancer. Because when we go and do peer review, which I've done quite a bit, um, we're not expected to be scientists, but we do want to be comfortable with some science. So they give a, a nice basic five-day course that, that helps people understand um, the science of breast cancer and um, how, how it relates in research. Um, there's patient navigator training, if you um, Google that. Um, mail care, uh, RAN, the Research Advocacy Network, and I can't speak highly enough about the Patient Centered Outcome Research Institute, not just because they funded <laughs> this session, but in all honesty, they have brought this idea of partnership and partnering with patients and other st stakeholders to really the front of attention in, in the United States and probably elsewhere. Uh, so with that, I say thank you. So before the slide goes up there, is this mic, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that I very gratefully work and live in the unceded territory, the Squamish Nation. And uh, we know what uh, the settlers know as Squamish, which is just north of Vancouver. 
So my life's journey uh, took a sharp turn 17 years ago when my oldest was born. I'm a mom to two kids, Zach and Evie, who are 17 and 14, and parenting them and our journey together completely informs my perspective. Our story and how we ended up embedded in the healthcare system is a story very much about Zach and uh, who he is. So he was born small but very healthy and absolutely gorgeous, as you can see. <laughs> Uh, but it was only as he started growing older into toddlerhood that we grew to realize he wasn't like other kids and that he had challenges that others didn't face. So by the time he was about uh, four and a half, his life was a series of appointments with speech and language pathologists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, pretty much any therapist you could think of to try to catch him up with his peers and make his life more comfortable. Um, between the ages of one and a half and four and a half, we saw doctor after doctor trying to figure out why he had so many seemingly unrelated challenges. Um, by the time he was four and a half, we had test after test after test trying to figure out what was going on. And ultimately, we ended up in medical genetics. And being very naive and thinking we knew more than we actually did, uh, we thought this was the place that would hold all the answers and we would find out what was going on and we thought we would find out were we actually the neurotic overachieving type A parents that uh, would be told, no, no, settle down, he will finally catch up, which was what a lot of doctors told us, or were we right to pursue this path? Was there really some hidden danger lurking in his genes that we needed to be proactive about? So on the one hand, we did get an answer, but it was an answer that we weren't expecting. Uh, we were told that we were right to go down this road and to really diligently try to pursue answers really in the face of uh, a lot of people telling us not to. Um, there was something likely genetic tying all these different things together, uh, but they couldn't put a name to it. Uh, he had short stature, uh, we th they thought a form of dwarfism, but he didn't fit into any of the over 200 known forms of, uh, of dwarfism. So that was the day of what we called his undiagnosis. And it was a really strange feeling because on the other hand, we were validated that we weren't actually you know, neurotic, um, but we would have this hanging over him until we had a diagnosis. We were told to be vigilant, but not what to be vigilant for. We were told not to over-medicalize him, but to be careful because we didn't know what medically could be coming down the pike for him. Um, so we tried to follow these instructions that conflicted with themselves. Uh, and we tried to move on and navigate the complicated world of healthcare, uh, really without any support or guidance um, on our own. And at least that was for the time being. So when Zach was about seven years old, seven or eight, uh, we were really fortunate because we got in contact with a group of like-minded individuals. And by that I mean it was parents, it was clinicians, and it was researchers. And the, we were all connected uh, to the world of rare disease uh, through uh, either family or through profession. And what we all had in common is we could see that rare disease patients were all falling through the cracks in the healthcare system, school system, uh, social services system, but basically not getting the care and services they needed. Um, we, uh, but we all had different insights through our different lenses uh, for what needed to change or what at least the needs were. Um, and out of that, we created an organization called the Rare Disease Foundation. There's our beautiful logo. And now none of us on the board that we created had more wisdom than the others. None of us had you know, more, uh, more in the hierarchy. Uh, what we did know is that we wanted better care and outcomes for people with rare disease, which incidentally, got to my advocacy bit, is one in 12, so individually rare, but actually very common And when we put us all together. Uh, we decided that what we wanted with our organization was to uh, create more research for people with rare disease and do that through honoring the wisdom of patients and families. Um, and that would be our roadmap to get there. We didn't call it patient-oriented anything. This is 10 years ago. Uh, we didn't know what it, this was a thing. We just called it, you know, logic and respectful of one another. So I want to say that getting this group of people together who were all a little bit type A looked like this. But you know, sometimes, because you know, we're always going in the same direction, it honestly sometimes uh, engaging with those who share wildly different perspectives can sometimes feel more like this. Um, we all made decisions in spectacularly different ways, sometimes with spectacularly different priorities. So how do you make this feel more like this? So this is what I'd actually like to talk about today from my point of view as a caregiver and uh, how to integrate patients and caregivers, how it's gone for me and what I've learned from personal experience. 
So with Rare Disease Foundation, I ended up sliding into this world of engaging with different groups. Uh, I was ended up being chair pretty quickly of the board. I don't know how that happened. I think I got suckered. We just had our AGM and here I am still, chair. Um, so as I did more, I ended up having opportunities to engage with different groups and with researchers as my name got connected with the foundation and with uh, patients. Um, work with uh, groups that were associated with patients or with researchers, ostensibly connected with patients or with rare disease. And I began to hear these words, patient partnership, patient engagement, patient oriented. Um, but one thing as I got engaged and involved with other uh, groups or people, one thing kept coming to mind. And I'll tell you why this kept coming to mind. By this time, I'd been chairing the board of Rare Disease Foundation for some time. And while we certainly didn't always agree on things, we always listened to each other's point of view. And uh, we always understood the value of each other's perspective and that we brought something important to the table. We worked together um, and we always moved forward in some way, respecting one another. And this is what I looked for when I just assumed other people were like this as adults. Uh, <laughs> um, and for some time, I didn't know how to discern which opportunities would have that feeling or that, um, that way of being and which ones were genuine that way and which ones would leave me feeling like this. I often felt like an afterthought, like I was there to tell my story for tears, for impact, emotional impact, but nobody actually wanted to do anything with me uh, afterwards with that story or with uh, what happened to us or with my knowledge. After sharing or after signing my name to a document, nothing happened, nobody talked to me. After trading actually my son's pain, nothing happened with that. And after being involved with something where I was an equal contributor, a leader, I felt cheated when I was treated like I didn't matter and more importantly, like my son didn't matter. So, how did I escape this black hole of tokenism? <laughs> Thankfully, I'm actually getting, and I got better, at assessing or sniffing out uh, earlier on whether or not an engagement opportunity would be successful. And I'm just really, like what Beverly said, what they said, you know. Um, but I'm gonna tell you anyway, because we have time and I'm not sending you on a break yet, so haha. Uh, <laughs> too bad for you. Uh, there's kind of three essential attributes that I look for in a team right from the beginning. And where any of them have been compromised in the past, I've been left feeling kind of used and unsatisfied in the end. And where I know I can um, ask for them at the beginning, kind of very explicitly, it leaves me in a very vulnerable position and my job is made as a patient, as somebody really who is uh, really low in a power structure, regardless of how well I can speak or how nicely I can dress, I am low in the power hierarchy. Um, it's a lot easier when a PI or somebody who's engaging me comes to me saying, these are the things that are here for you. And, uh, and then we can work together to make sure that they're implemented in a way that works for everybody on the team. So I'd like to take you one by one through these uh, attributes, I'm not gonna read them because I'm sure you all can read them yourselves, and how they've either worked or haven't worked for me in the past really 10 years that I've been doing this. So I wanna see if anyone can like go back in the way back machine of their minds to an eternity ago in the online world, which eternity online is like three years. <laughs> so, oh, there we go. Does anybody remember three years ago? Does anybody not remember this? Oh, thank goodness, everybody's got a long memory. So for anybody who needs a little memory, sorry, I need a drink. Like three years ago, if you're online, Facebook and Twitter were just like bang, 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 with this dress, this yellow and gold dress. That came up, like, what color is this dress? And when this came out, oh, it's yellow and gold, it can't be anything else. And then much to my surprise, a few people were like, no, it's blue and black, and I thought, you know when you see an uh, optical illusion and you just kind of have to do this with your head or your eyes and then it flips to the other thing? Well, it wouldn't flip. So clearly my friends were lying to me or trolling me or something. And then I guess I realized, no, they were not lying to me. And it was just a weird thing where some people saw something differently. And of course, being the obnoxious mother that I am, I took this as a time to do like an object lesson for my children where I told them, you know, you can't actually experience somebody else's perspective. As much as we like that expression of you can walk a mile in somebody else's shoes, you actually can't. 
You cannot walk a mile in anybody else's shoes. You can listen and you can believe and then take that to learn lessons from them. And, and so, you know, I was being the obnoxious mother and saying that it's really important to really listen to the perspectives of others who are not like you. And then they go, blah, blah, yes, mom. My daughter actually saw it as blue and gold, so I don't know what she was looking at. Um, <laughs> but okay. Um, so anyhow, th I was done being an obnoxious mother and this was still going blah, 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 blah all over online. And of course, you take the internet sleuths that are saying, um, had to go find the real dress, what color, had, you know, by then I was over it and moved on to the next meme. Uh, but people actually went and looked for the dress and that they found the real designer and the real dress and it was actually, um, does anybody know what the color of the real dress was? No, it was not. Most people saw it as white and gold and a minority of people saw it as blue and black. The real dress is blue and black and it was some weird lighting and the, look at your face. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Okay, I am one of those weird people that had to go find it too, because I'm like this. And, um, and uh, so it was really, it took listening to the truth of the minority of people to know what the actual color of the dress was. So that was the real object lesson of this. So of course I had to tell my kids and they were in you know, a eye roll and all stuff like that. So that's the real lesson of this. I thought that was so interesting. So my point, what is my point? So my, oh, there it goes. So my point is this, is that my perspective as a caregiver to a kid with a rare disease, a teenager, he just turned 17, uh, with uh, a rare disease, is that our perspective and our voyage through this world has not been one that's traditionally been uh, uh, valued or seen or used or um, mined in uh, the research table, right? And that knowledge is the value that I bring. And what I bring is 17 years of navigating a healthcare, social services, and education system that's not set up to look after our ne his needs or the needs of our family. I've educated myself and paid for that education in sleepless nights. You know, it was six, he was six years old before I ever slept through the night. Scanning peer-reviewed articles. I beg people for access because I can't pay for them going to literally countless appointments, reading lab work and medical reports, creating Excel spreadsheets of symptoms against medication do doses and treatment protocols, writing requests for fundings, funding so that he can have um, uh, disability aids, and so much more. My life is embedded in a rare disease experience from which there is literally no respite. I don't go home from it at the end of the day. I don't get vacation from it. And this education deserves respect at the table, full stop. And so does the PhD in lived experience, as one of my friends puts it, that every patient partner brings to the table. So that's the perspective. So the second attribute I'd like to talk about is uh, about lowering barriers. And I'm not gonna list barriers because they're endless and they're different for everybody. Um, what I do want to talk is about why it's so important, and uh, other speakers spoke really well about them. And, but I would like to talk about why. Why do you need to treat patients and caregivers differently than other, uh, other people on the team? And I love this graphic because it talks about uh, the difference between equity, equality, and justice. And the difference is that patients and caregivers truly do have more and different barriers than other people on a research team. And I want to circle back to that point about perspective. And if you truly value and need that patient perspective, patient caregiver perspective on the team, then you need to make sure that those perspectives are accessible, that they can get to the table. So if you actually look at me, I, I actually come from a bundle of privilege, and I recognize that. I know that as a patient caregiver person, um, I have a lot of privilege, but even within that privilege, Parenting a kid with rare disease is hard, like really damned hard. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I, I love him and he's a blessing and makes my life infinitely better. Both my kids do. But society puts financial, physical, and mental health barriers in front of me every day, every day. Um, just, in the, just in the past two weeks, we've had five specialist appointments. It's three hours round trip to get to every single one. Uh, we've had one ER admission. Uh, this is why I'm reading this, because I'm a little tired. 
uh, when he's actually well enough, this is on top of like the daily health stuff, his meds and everything. When he's well enough to go to school, he goes twice a week for 45 minutes. And the only way of him getting there is for me to be there at home to drive him uh, because there's no wheelchair accessible way for him to get to school. And then I have to wait for him to be done and then drive him home. So everything rolls around that. I also have another kid who has her own needs and deserves to be looked after as well. The question of me having a regular job is, uh, has not been an option for me since he was born, really, because of his health care needs. So barriers have to do with me getting to a physical meeting. Is it possible? Can I get respite? So when engaging with partners, with parents, with people's living, living or looking after somebody with chronic health conditions is, um, can you make virtual meetings? Can uh, you do it by email? Do they have the financial wherewithal to have a computer to do that? Can you supply that for them? So it's all about creating a space in a respectful way for them to access you and you to access each other. And, and asking them, what will make it easier for you to give me your knowledge and for us to work together? Things like office hours and times of meetings. If they have a job, they can't do it during their office hours. If they're bringing kids around after school, they can't do it after school. So it, all those uh, um, uh, asynchronous communication is a fabulous thing. Uh, one final thing I'd like to mention, because a lot of people don't realize this, is that a lot of us who are caregivers and patients walk around with unrecognized and untreated uh, medical post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of you are based out of hospitals. And for a lot of us to go into a hospital setting when we don't have to for treatment, uh, re-traumatizes us. So thinking about where you have physical meetings, having them off-site is often easier for us. I wonder how many times you're uh, creating engagement opportunities, especially initial ones where you're saying, hey, have a meeting, come and see what we're about. I wonder how many people aren't even showing up to that first time because it's not a space that they feel safe in. So finally, that third item was the elephant, or often the piggy bank, that's in the room that nobody wants to talk about, compensation. Well, I've been doing this for a while. I still don't like talking about it. It makes me feel all squidgy. Um, so when I started doing this uh, a long time ago, uh, I did it as a volunteer, and I didn't see it as a problem. And uh, I, I'm sorry to say I was ignorant to the fact that uh, there were so many who wanted to participate and couldn't because of financial barriers. Uh, but slowly as I've been very fortunate to uh, learn from others uh, what a huge barrier it is for people who aren't compensated. It's become a bigger barrier for me as our financial needs have gotten greater as well. But mostly I've been learning from other people, thankfully. Um, if you're volunteering, and you're working, or you want to volunteer, or you want to part participate. Volunteering means you can't go to work. And if you're not working, you're not paying for your meds. Uh, you're not pay paying for your, um, for your therapies. You're not paying for your heat. Uh, so what happens, as you put so well, is you get retired people, you get stay-at-home moms, and you get people with privilege, which is great if that's who you want to hear from. But if you're really want to engage with the people who are most compromised in the healthcare system, that's not them. And if you really want to engage a diverse population that's representative of the people that have the biggest challenges in the healthcare system, compensation could play a huge part in uh, increasing the diversity of who you're engaging with. And, and, and then there's a whole other thing, apart from that whole actually wanting to engage with different people, there's an underlying power structure. And going in as a patient, it's just made me increasingly uncomfortable as I sit around a table with a group of people who are all there as employed people. And I'm supposed to be on an equal level with them. And I'm there as a volunteer. And there's already this uh, power discrepancy between us. And to know that I'm not getting paid for doing labor while they are just feels fundamentally inequitable to me. So I think there's a real issue of equity and compensation. Um, it feels like tokenism, even if I'm, it's, you know what, especially if I'm doing work, it feels like tokenism if I'm not getting paid. So I've stopped. The, the only thing I volunteer for anymore is Rare Disease Foundation because I'm, actually we have two employees now, Woo! Uh, but our whole it's a volunteer board and it's mostly volunteer run. So it's equitable because we're all volunteers. 
Uh, I won't volunteer anymore. I won't do it for my sake because it feels lousy, but I won't do it for the sake of everybody else um, because I want to make sure that it's not just my voice that's speaking. So I know that there's all kinds of complicated issues that we can talk in, uh, in our uh, discussion afterwards about compensation, about um, disability benefits, institutional policies. Uh, but I think what matters is, first of all, is that commitment to the idea that the patient is there as an equal member. And I think if, you, if people first uh, move towards that commitment, then those other issues can be resolved. Now, there are resources. We can talk about those later. So I would like to say that in the past 10 years, I've gotten super savvy at sniffing out those opportunities that are not authentic and that, you know, I don't get sucked in anymore. I would like to say that, but this is not always true. Uh, not for any of us, I think. And I, th I think the problem is that sometimes some issues are so um, close to my heart and matter so deeply to me that I want them to work even when I know that they're not going to work. And I think that's the danger for patient partners because a lot of what we do, even though we want compensation, even though we want equality, all of that stuff is partnership. The reason we're doing this stuff is because we, I was gonna say we want to make things better, but we need to make things better. All the, frankly, crap that my family's gone through, all the pain, all the suffering my kid has gone and continues to go through, we need to wrestle some kind of meaning out of that so that other people don't go through that. And that's why I do this stuff. So sometimes an opportunity comes along that I think, oh, I can make a change, like a real, something different can happen here. And then I get suckered. <laughs> so, so sometimes I make bad decisions. So recently, I was asked to join uh, a, a new group. Well, it's actually not new. I was asked to join a new group at where my son received health care. And it was an endeavor that had already started with no patients, there was already a team, and there were no patients, so that was like yellow flag, waving, but it was really important to me. It was, it was something that really had impacted, about a subject that had really impacted his care. So I went to the meeting, even though I was like, ah, don't do it, don't do it. So I joined them for the meeting. I laid bare our experience, like I laid it bare, and this is hard, and I explained how important it was that patient experiences inform how they went forward. The, they said that that would come, uh, yellow flag. They sent around a document, emailed people in the meeting, uh, and it was a document to get funding for this project. Uh, I sent back edits. Uh, they asked me to sign this document so that it would go forward to get funding from um, the hospital foundation. And I, I said, I, I really think we need more patients on this team. We, we need to have more people involved. And they said, oh, that will come. Oh, yellow flag, <laughs> big yellow flag but I signed it. Do you think I heard from them again? I got nothing. I didn't hear anything about the edits I sent. I didn't get back. Usually when I do things like, you know, you get the team gets, oh, we submitted, blah, 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 you know, we're waiting to hear back. Nothing, 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 months. I finally emailed back the main players and said, hey, I was wondering what the status was. What's going on with the project? Nothing, not a courtesy email back. Well, two months later, the icing on the cake was I got the, an email from the engagement group at the hospital, one of those stock emails sent to the email list of like everybody saying, oh, we're putting together a steering committee for this project that we got funding for. Would you like to be on it? What? I thought I was a part of this already. So, yeah, I'll tell you one thing. I have the names from the email of everybody involved in this project, and not only will I never engage with this group again, I will not recommend it to anybody I know to engage with them again. Once you lose trust like that, it's not gained back. And patients talk to each other. And when, the, we, when I engage with anybody, the first thing I do is ask everybody I know, have you engaged with these people before? What are they like? Do they respect you? So it's a, it's a dangerous thing to make a mistake like that because you'll find out very quickly whether or not people talk. So thankfully, this is not characteristic of the majority of the engagement opportunities I'm a part of. I'm happy to say that most of them are uh, characteristic of a very uh, collegial atmosphere of respect and hopefully mutual learning. Um, I think what made me initially, I, I really uh, echo what, what you were saying, Beverly, 
my, uh, had this engagement opportunity with Dr. Christine Chambers, who's a, um, a pain researcher, pediatric pain researcher out of the IWK in, in Halifax. And she was the first researcher I engaged with who really made me feel like uh, what I had to say had inherent value, that I didn't have to justify what my opinions were to the, um, to the researchers on the team. And it was an incredibly freeing feeling and let me go forward to other engagement opportunities with more confidence and that was amazing. She and I were working one day and uh, I came up with the idea of, you know, like in a race, everybody just has to stay in their lane. The researchers, the policy people, the patients, the caregivers, we all have these bodies of knowledge that are equally important and we just need to respect each other and know that we have these areas of expertise and they're all equally value. Valuable. So that's a pretty ba basic value set, I think, to come from. And for some people, I think it's a real shift to start in uh, patient partnership. Part and but that idea where everybody's uh, perspective is valuable, even ones that don't come from an academic background. But I think it's a human value, that idea of respect. And I think once you can just really integrate that, just respecting that somebody's perspective is real and that it's necessary, any partnership opportunity will grow from that. And I think that's all we really need. So thank you very much. What we thought as a collective to do for the second part of the short course was to open a discussion. And what we'll do while we discuss, and I think it's just like sharing and asking from you, but we can also all uh, get included in that discussion. We'll try to you know, set a, a list of learnings that you can actually um, leave with uh, or think about in your own organizations, projects, lives. Um, uh, so we can take a break of 30 minutes and then just come back and, and discuss. I think that was the yeah. plan. And then we can also send you at the end, we've got all your emails, so we have a list of resources yeah. we can send you that we have from before and then from our discussion we can um, personalize those some more. Exactly. Good. Great. So see you in a few. <laughs>